This happened in the summer and I believe I was about 12 at the time. I was staying in a hotel in a fairly large city with my mom and my younger brother. We were visiting our extended family but chose not to stay in their house. My brother is younger than me by a decent amount so I was usually told to keep an eye on him. On the day we arrived my mom told me to do just that while she checked us in and received our room card. So my brother and I sat down on the couch in the lobby and relaxed a little bit. While we were sitting, a man in about his mid-forties walked into the hotel. The couch was facing the hotel doors, so I got a good look at him. I remember that he was very average looking. Describing his features and details could generate several different images. The guy comes in and sits on the couch opposite ours. I didn't think anything of it until I realized that he didn't go up to the counter first. He just came in and sat down. It made me feel a little uncomfortable. I thought that he might have followed us in. Thankfully, my mom called us over and told us that our room was ready. We left the lobby and went to our room. Shortly after, we left the hotel to go meet family. I forgot about the man for the rest of the day. We returned at about 7 and my mom told us that we could go swimming in the hotel pool. We all went to our rooms, changed, and went to the pool. A few minutes after we got into the water, the same man from before walked in and sat down. He was wearing jeans and a sweater, so he definitely wasn't going swimming. Again, we didn't think much of it, until I could see that my mom was visibly worried. She pointed him out to me and said that if he didn't leave within five minutes, we needed to go back to our rooms. Five minutes passed and he was still there, so we got our things and left. By then, it was close to eight. We had brought a rented movie to watch, so we planned to watch that and go straight to bed. I noticed that my mom was a little on edge because of the man watching us, and I got a little more worried myself too. Halfway through the movie, my mom got up to get in the shower. While she was in there, someone knocked on the door and said, Housekeeping, in a high-pitched voice. I thought it was weird that the cleaning staff would come this late, but we needed another towel, so I answered the door. I wish I hadn't been so stupid. It was the creepy man. He gave me a smile and a little wave. I just stood there, kind of motionless. My mind automatically went to the worst possible situation, kidnapping, torture, etc. I heard the water in the shower turn off. He stood there as well for a moment, and then he spoke. How was your swim? At that moment, my mom came out of the shower, saw the man at the door, pulled me back, and slammed the door. She locked it, then she called the front desk from her hotel phone to report the guy. I told her to just call the police, but she didn't listen. She then requested we switch rooms. I then heard footsteps stomping down the hallway away from our room. Thankfully, the guy had left. After that, we switched hotel rooms and didn't see the guy again during our stay. A while ago, I was staying in an upscale hotel in the safe area of a large Midwestern city. I'm a 16-year-old female and I was in a room all by myself, with my parents a few doors down. In theory, this isn't unsafe by any means, but I had bad luck on this particular trip. Our first night there passed without incident, me in my room, my parents in theirs. I watched a pay-per-view movie and ate way too much from the snack bar. I didn't have any reason to feel unsafe. The next morning, we did the usual tourist stuff that one does when visiting a new city. As we ate breakfast in the hotel restaurant, I noticed a man who looked to be in his 60s staring at me for an abnormally long amount of time. I won't lie, as a young, decently attractive female, I'm used to getting the occasional inappropriate look from a guy, so I ignored it and chalked it up to him either being a perv or thinking I look like his granddaughter or something. The next night, my parents allowed me to meet up with a friend for dinner who lived in the area. He met me in the hotel lobby, and we had a nice dinner and then went back to the hotel for drinks. Yes, I know I'm underage. Coincidentally, the same man who had been eyeing me earlier was at the bar. This time, I knew I didn't remind him of his granddaughter. Even with my buff guy friend next to me, his eyes traced every curve of my body. I felt unsettled and mentioned it to my friend, Ethan, who glanced over and also seemed really weirded out by how obvious this guy was leering. We left the bar quickly, and by now it was around 12.30am. Ethan walked me to the elevators of the hotel, and once I pushed the button, left. I wish I would have asked him to stay because no sooner had he walked away that my creeper came rolling around the corner 
and stood there waiting with me for the elevator. I felt so uncomfortable knowing that he would be seeing what floor I was going to, but it hadn't occurred to me to get off on a different floor at the time, and even if it did, he planned on following me, so it would have been just as bad a move. When we were in the elevator together, I tried to keep my eyes averted from his, but they literally bore into my body. He kept trying to step closer, and I kept backing up, too scared to even speak. What freaked me out even more was that he hadn't pressed a separate elevator button, so he planned on getting off when I did. When I got to my floor, I almost ran to my room, and the guy just stood at the end of the hallway, waiting to see where I was going. I stayed in my room for 15 minutes until I was sure he was gone before I told my parents what had happened. They were freaked out and told the hotel staff, but there was no sign of the guy and it was really late, so I just locked my door and tried to get some sleep. I had almost drifted off when I heard a knock at my door. Now, I'm not an idiot. I didn't just go and open the door at nearly 2am. Instead, I turned on the light and froze. At this point, my intuition had kicked in and I knew it was the guy. I was near tears, but the knocking kept continuing, harder and harder, so I finally shouted and asked who it was. The voice that replied to me was the most chilling thing I had ever heard, high-pitched but growly, almost giggly, so disturbing I can barely describe it. It's hotel staff. Please let me in. I was terrified. A look through the peephole confirmed that it was the same creepy old guy. I locked myself in the bathroom and called my dad's phone. He has a habit of always keeping his ringer on, so he answered me almost immediately, and I tried to tell him what was wrong through my tears. The guy from before, I managed, is at my door. And what happened next gives me nightmares. My dad naturally went into superhero mode and opened his door to find the old man in just a robe, masturbating. It's pretty obvious to piece together what he was planning, and I still dream about it and have severe PTSD from it. My dad slugged the dude in the face and made sure he didn't move an inch while my mom called hotel security. We pressed charges, and the guy is in prison now on what I think are assault with intent to force himself upon me. I have recently moved to a new town and have been job hunting. I stopped by a hotel on the shoreline and went in to see if they needed someone for desk work. Inside was vacant, dark, and smelt stale. The man behind the desk had an extremely thick accent and it was difficult for me to understand him. It seemed like he was the only person in the whole building and I got a strange vibe from the whole place, but stayed to fill out the application and turn it in as quickly as possible. I could feel him staring at me the entire time. The man muttered something under his breath and took my application. After I left, I decided most likely I would not be accepting a position there because of the strangeness of the situation and really regretted leaving my phone number, address, and other personal info on the application. Later that evening, I'm at home watching the Olympics in my living room, around 10 or so. I go into my bedroom to grab my phone off the charger and I see I have a missed call from just a few minutes earlier. It's strange for anyone to be calling me so late, but I redialed the number to satisfy my curiosity. A woman with a thick accent answers and demands to know who is calling. I politely told her that I had missed a call from this number. She starts screaming. No, 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 Samantha. At the top of her lungs and hangs up. It freaked me out that she had used my name in her crazy talk, but figured it was some crackhead that misdialed my number. I take my phone back with me into the living room and sit down. Right then my phone starts ringing again. I answer, and it's the man from the hotel yelling my name over and over again. He is screaming at the top of his lungs and I can hear the woman yelling too. I could catch pieces of what they were saying, but in between their accents and both of them screaming it was difficult to get it all. I heard, Disturb my phone. Disturb your life. You can't see. And that's about it. I hung up really fast and proceeded to flip out. They called back 14 times within about 20 minutes. Thankfully, I don't have my voicemail set up, so they couldn't leave any. My husband came home at around midnight and I told him what happened. He laughed it off and said they were probably on drugs and just dialed my number to mess with me. I really hated the fact that these people had a decent chunk of my personal information, 
but I figured they were too crazy to do anything but make creepy phone calls at night. I finally calmed down enough to go to sleep at around 3 in the morning. About half an hour later, I wake up to my dog barking, growling, and charging at the back door. I know immediately something is wrong because she never acts like this and is well trained. My husband and I both sprinted into the living room and saw a hand reaching through the doggy door, clawing at the tile. I screamed and my husband grabbed me and we went into the bedroom and locked the door. I dialed the police and thankfully they were there within 10 minutes. The man was long gone, but I knew exactly who it was. I gave them my statement and showed them my call log from earlier. They called the number, but it was a prepaid phone, so there wasn't a lot they could do to trace it. By the time the police left, it was around 5.30 in the morning, which was okay with me since I wouldn't be able to sleep anyways. A few hours later, my husband, who was still really angry and I, decided to go to the hotel to try to get some information about the guy and inform the staff that this guy was nuts. We spoke to the manager there, and he told us that the man I described had been fired a year ago for stalking a housemaid. Oh my god, what was he doing in the lobby last week then? They checked the security cameras and discovered that he was constantly around the hotel and staring in the windows. I guess he had snuck in while the manager left the desk right as I walked in. The manager contacted the police and was able to file trespassing charges against him. Now at least the police are looking for him. At this point I'm in tears. I had given a crazy person all my info and he was harassing and stalking me. I'm still receiving phone calls from strange numbers during the night, but luckily he hasn't returned to the house, as far as I know. I contacted my references I had used on my application to let them know what was going on. Apparently, my old boss was left a voicemail at around 2 in the morning on Monday of heavy breathing and some strange moaning noises. This past week, I haven't been able to sleep at all. I'm a nervous wreck and jump out of my skin every time my phone rings or I hear my dog barking. My next door neighbor's parents moved from India to the UK back in the 60s. After retiring, they made a habit of heading back there every year to visit family and friends, ultimately spending around half their time traveling through India and half their time here. Long story short, one year they invite my family along. I was 15, now 25, and thought I was some hardcore Viking rock prince because I had long blonde hair and red kerrang. Fun fact, curly hair ruins everything. I look like a cherub. Now, my neighbor's dad had planned this holiday like it's a military campaign. When we arrive, he hands each of us, including my 11-year-old brother and sister, a brown folder containing our itinerary, hotel brochures, money, conversion charts, train times tables, four passport photos of ourselves for forms, and a list of names under the header, useful people. Forget Viking rock prints, I'm James Bond. Other than the fact that I'm mistaken for a girl on several occasions, my favorite being when one of my neighbor's relatives asks my mom why she lets me dress like a boy and offers to have a sari fitted for me, I have an amazing time. Until, we rock up to this huge hotel in the middle of the jungle. Honestly, the arse end of nowhere. The nearest village is a three hour drive down a dirt road, just before sunset, in the jungle. I pull out the brochure, and it'd be safe to say that this place is under new management, there's a single light on about five stories up. As we pull into the drive, we spot a group of men clustered around a large fire. One of them stands and starts shouting something but is silenced by the guy next to him with a slap to the back of his head. One of the group comes sauntering over and motions our driver to wind down the window. Imagine Alfred Hitchcock as an Indian drug lord and you have a pretty good idea of the man now flapping his jowls through our window. He peers into the back, spots us, and cracks the dictionary definition of a poo-eating grin. In broken English, he welcomes us to the hotel, glances over our reservations, and ushers us into the lobby. This is when things get really weird. The place is deserted. Not the staff has gone to bed deserted. It was like whoever was here got out of here in a hurry deserted. There were toppled chairs in the lobby. Hitchcock tells us that our rooms aren't ready yet. It's now 9pm and offers us some food while we wait. The dining room is huge, empty and our order is taken by a boy no older than 9 who promptly vanishes 
closing the doors behind him. We hear a motorbike engine outside, and an hour later something vaguely resembling our order appears on a variety of mismatched dinnerware. No idea where any of it came from. At this point, we are all pretty unnerved and everyone started making lame jokes to ease the tension. We were only there for one night. Everything had been paid for in advance and we were in a large group, 11 in total, with two people who spoke Hindi and Kakani, so felt pretty sure we could deal with any weirdness. Hitchcock waddles in and takes us to our rooms. Every one of them is stripped bare apart from the beds and bedside tables. Exposed wires poke out of the walls where you'd expect a TV and or phone and there are rectangular patches of discolored wallpaper, suggesting that someone finally took a stand against terrible hotel artwork. The only decoration is this creepy little metal horse that's just sitting on one of the bedside tables. I'm sharing with my little bro and insist on taking the bed closest to the door, presumably thinking I could summon Thor if things got hairy. Hitchcock lingers in the doorway for a little while, flashing his pearly browns and giving me the creeper eyes. I close the door on him, we dump our bags, check the door is locked and have bro chats until we pass out. I wake up, no clue when, clocks clearly didn't fit with the whole minimalist crack den vibe the management was going for, but it's pitch black, to hearing the door to my room clicking shut, the door that is no further than a foot from my head. Oh god I think, I'm no viking rock prince, I'm a flying baby that plays a harp. I cower under the surprisingly clean blankets until my heart stops threatening to bust out of my ribs and redecorate the ceiling. Stealthy ninja roll out of my bed and go to the door. The thing's unlocked. Oh god. I barricade it with the bedside table, check little bro is alive, get into bed, see our bags, and then to the barricade. Notice that mine is open. Now plot twist. Nothing's missing. Camera, wallet, clothes, super secret spy dossier, everything is intact. I convince myself that I crap my pants over nothing and go back to sleep. Side note, little bro slept through the whole thing. Morning comes and we all want to get out of there as soon as possible. Neighbor's dad kicks off about how weird the whole thing is to Hitchhawk and gets half of our money back. Excellent. We head outside and my sister points out the charred remains of one of the hotel beds is what's left of the fire pit. Excellent. Turns out that our driver, who had a room in the place, had decided to sleep in the bus because he, in his own words, didn't want their funny business. Apparently there were people coming and going all night. He woke up to see a guy's nose against the window just staring in at him. The driver hit the window and the dude scampered off into the jungle like freaking Mowgli. We give a driver a huge tip, Hitchcock waves at us from the lobby, adjusts his crotch and plods back in. We leave, thinking the weirdness is over. About an hour into the journey I decide to take a look at our itinerary so I pull out my spy folder. My heart instantly sinks. One of my passport photos is gone. A perfect 35 by 45 millimeter rectangle missing from the corner. Three little viking rock cherubs stare up at me, mourning their fallen brother. I search the folder, asking my parents if they took it for something, starting to lose my crap. Everything from the night before rushes back. I explain what happened and there's this weird moment of silence while everyone looks at each other. Turns out that everybody had heard someone outside at their door at some point during the night, but had deadbolted them before going to sleep. Bro and I had no deadbolt. Hitchcock put us in that room on purpose. Driver suggests that we head back to the hotel and demand satisfaction tips galore for driver. We arrive at the hotel, the doors are padlocked, Hitchcock and his cronies have vanished. The cherry on top of this cake is the horse. The little metal horse that was sat on our bedside table had been placed on the step in front of the door. I took it. Free souvenir. Screw you, Hitchcock. Long story short, don't go to India. so I get a message on a dating site from a girl. Not my type, but I check the message out. Hey, you're super hot. Want to come over to my hotel room? I was flattered, but definitely was not interested. However, she might be a good person, so I messaged her back. Not really looking for that, but I'm down to chat. No, I really want you to come over. I'm on vacation, and I'm at the hotel near your house. Once again, I say, 
I'm sorry, but I'm not interested. Where are you from and why choose here to vacation to? I'm from here, but I'm at a hotel wanting you to smash. Come over. At this point, I was sketched out. Why rent a hotel room when you live here? It's a smaller city. So I did the smart thing. I blocked her. I sent a message beforehand saying goodbye and hope she finds someone that is interested. Fast forward 30 minutes. She made a second account and sent me this. I'm serious. I really want you to come over. Here's something to persuade you. And it was an Imgur link to a picture of a naked woman in a bed. So, I block her again. Not even 15 minutes went by and there was another account and message from her. At this point, I think I'm getting trolled. My friends could easily have pulled this off. I wanted to call their bluff, so I created a new kick account, gave my info, and told her to go on video. I was going to catch my friends. Well, it was her. She quickly went into doing things trying to persuade me. I deleted the kick and avoided it. Deleted my dating account. Was completely sketched out. About two months later, I reactivated it one lonely night. About a day later, I get a message from her saying that she saw me riding my bike downtown a few weeks ago. She described what I was wearing. I had enough. I told her I could take this to the police for harassment. I actually didn't know if I had a good case, but I wanted to scare her away. It worked. Hadn't heard a peep since. I'd never been more grateful to think with my brain instead of my other head. So my girlfriend and I got a motel for two nights. It was not the best motel, not on the best side of town, but it was cheap so it worked for us. I was 20 and she was 19 at the time. Anyways, the first night went fine. However, the second night things started to get strange. At about midnight there was a banging on our door. I looked out the peephole to see a scraggly looking shorter white man standing outside my door with jeans on and no shirt. My first thought was that this guy was probably on drugs or something It was probably banging on everyone's door for whatever reason. Whatever, I'm tired, time to go to sleep. Then about 2am as my girlfriend and I are starting to fall asleep, I think I hear the man say something outside. You and your girl are gonna die tonight. No, I tried to trick myself into thinking that I didn't really hear this. I mean why would some random stranger say this? How did he even know I had a girl in the room? Had he been watching us earlier? All these thoughts are going through my mind while my girlfriend is asleep. Her name is Jane. I don't want to disturb her, but at this point, I'm feeling pretty nervous, so I nudge her awake. I say quietly, I think that guy is still outside. She is half asleep and thinks I'm being paranoid. He begins to knock on her door again. Alarmed, we get up to look through the peephole. This time, he is standing in front of our door but looking the opposite direction with his hands behind his back, almost militaristically. I begin calling the police from the motel phone. Jane thought I was overreacting, but I was too afraid not to call. I told the police about the man, and they said they would send somebody out. I called the lobby and told them as well, but they said they couldn't do anything and that I should call the police. Sure enough, about ten minutes later, actually a pretty decent response time, a police car rolls through the parking lot. Then they leave. What? They must not have seen the guy. Great. Now this guy starts talking more craziness outside. He says stuff along the lines of, Man, you called the cops? You're just a freaking baby. I'm gonna beat you to death. But stops shortly after, and we didn't hear anything from him for another 10 to 15 minutes. Then again outside I hear him say, You and your girl are gonna die tonight. Jane heard him this time as well and she instantly was on my level of terrifiedness and she hadn't heard this before and insinuated I was over paranoid or hearing things. She insisted we call the police and this time I let her talk to them. She was much more shooken up on the phone and conveyed a necessary sense of urgency I wasn't capable of. Again, a police cruiser comes through the parking lot. I see the car is about to leave again. Angry, I walked outside to the cruiser. I felt safe enough to walk outside since the police were right there. I asked why they were leaving and they said that they talked to the guy but he wasn't doing anything obviously criminal so they couldn't do anything about it. The officer said he was messing with the air conditioner to our room. I explained to the officer the comments we heard this man making 
about killing us, but again, he told me there was nothing he could do. Oh my God, right? So the cops leave again. They leave me and my girlfriend alone at this motel with this crazy guy for the second time. Now he's angry and must have seen me talking to the cops. Again, he's knocking on our door, calling me a little baby, saying he's going to kill me. So I call the cops for the third time. About 15 minutes later, I heard the sound of handcuffs outside my room. I had never felt so relieved. I don't know what happened and why they finally decided to arrest him. I'm just glad that they did. I could hear him saying, What did I do? I, I didn't do anything. While they were cuffing him. As soon as the police were gone, my girlfriend and I left the motel. Luckily, my friend was awake at 4 a.m. when I called him, and we crashed at his house for the night. When we were pulling out of the motel parking lot, I could see the man in the back of the police car looking at me. The deadest and most soulless eyes I had ever seen. I was 14 when this occurred, and I'm 22 now but I still remember in crisp detail and it freaks me out to this day thinking about what could have happened if things turned out differently. School was out for summer and I had convinced my mom to send me to Russia for a couple of months to visit my grandparents. We moved to North America when I was little and I hadn't been back much since. Plus I thought it would be fun being on my first trip abroad by myself. She agreed and off I went on my first solo transatlantic journey. My grandparents are great people and have always spoiled me and my mom rotten and they were ecstatic their only granddaughter wanted to visit, so they planned a little vacation of their own with me a month after I arrived to a popular beach resort city in Turkey. We were to stay at a five-star resort in Ankara for two weeks. I thought that was spectacular, getting to travel to not one, but two countries in one summer, and to a fancy exotic place like Turkey. I was dying to go. But, full disclosure, when I arrived to Russia, it wasn't really what I was expecting. My grandparents are really protective people and I couldn't do much or go anywhere by myself, so it got boring pretty fast and I spent most of my days playing PSP in my room. I was also accustomed to being active and wanted to do things like go jogging, which I did every day at home, so I gave my grandparents a hard time about this since they wouldn't let me go alone and naturally they couldn't really keep up. Then after about a month the time came to go to Turkey and I was super excited to finally get some freedom and a change of scenery. I had been pent up at home too long. The resort they had picked was sprawled over a pretty large area. However, it was all very well secured and isolated from the rest of the city, and there was also a huge garden on the property which was ideally suited for jogging. This time, I had my own room separate from my grandparents, so I took this chance to go off by myself and explore the grounds. Most of the time, I would go jogging in the mornings when it was cooler with my big old iPod, so I couldn't hear anything that was going on around me but I figured it was pretty safe since it was a nice hotel with plenty of tourists. Then I started to notice him. A pretty innocuous seeming gardener in his late 40s, early 50s in a green uniform. I remember he looked like a shriveled old date from too many years in the sun. He would always wave or say something in broken English as I passed by while he trimmed the shrubs or mowed the lawn. I would politely wave back, smile or nod, but I didn't really pay much attention. Fast forward about 10 days and I was really enjoying myself. It was fun to swim in the pool and the sea, the food was great, and my grandparents had let up a lot so I could do more by myself. However, they didn't know about my morning runs in the gardens, and I wasn't going to tell them because I wasn't sure they would approve. So one morning at around 7am while I'm jogging, I see the gardener again, but this time it's clear he's trying to get my attention. He waves at me and yells something, so I stop and pull out my earphones trying to figure out what he wants. Now, I know he works for the hotel, so I don't really suspect anything. He waves at me again and motions me to come forward. I'm confused, but I figured he wants to tell me something, so I politely approach. He's standing at a trail that goes deeper into the gardens and foliage. He's smiling and gesturing, and I can see he's holding something in his hand. Rosa, he says. Beautiful Rosa. Then I notice he's holding a rose and extending it to me. At this point I'm confused and a little freaked out about what he's thinking, but I stay put. Usually the hotel staff there are chatty, but nice enough. My grandparents would always get pulled into conversations with him about things. 
I figured it's something like this now and I don't want to be rude but still want to be on my way without offending the old man. He hands the flower to me and I take it, thinking maybe he wants to show me some roses that are in bloom, but he keeps waving and gesturing like he wants me to follow him, and stupidly I walk closer. He has another flower in his hand and he backs away more. Then suddenly he stops and starts to lower it a little. That's when I notice he's holding his other hand behind his back too, and he's holding something. I look ahead up the trail and see a little cabin type thing where I assume they keep their gardening supplies. Something clicks in my head then and I instantly back away. He sees me do that and tries to smile saying, Rosa, again, and moves the hand he's holding behind his back while lurching toward me. That's when I see he's holding some kind of rag. Without hesitation, I drop the rose he handed me, turn around and run for it at full speed. I don't stop to look back and run like mad back to the hotel. It's not until the doors close behind me and I'm among other people that I look back and see if he's followed me. I don't see him anymore and my heart is beating like crazy. I go back to my hotel and wait for my grandparents to wake up. I never told them any of what happened that day and spent the rest of my vacation glued to their side. I thought that if I'd said anything, they would get even more paranoid about my safety and blame me for wandering off on my own. Also, I didn't want to ruin the remaining days for them. I saw the gardener once more on the beach. I remember him talking to a security guard. I remember growing very uncomfortable and sinking into my sun chair when I saw him. Then he looked at me and smiled. I scowled at him as he mouthed the word Rosa tauntingly and smiled again. I still remember the anger bubbling in my stomach and how much I wanted to cleave his face in, but I just froze and stared. He walked away and I went back to pretending nothing ever happened. Needless to say, I never went on any more morning jogs and neither did I want to until long after the summer had ended and I'd returned back home. When I was about 16, I went on a trip to Cabo San Lucas with my family and my best friend. My friend and I had a hotel room to ourselves for the trip, something I was naturally excited about. One afternoon, I was getting on the elevator and a security guard got on with me. As the elevator rose, he looked at me and said, Excuse me, were you wearing a green skirt on the beach the other day? Um, yes, why? I replied. I was already reflexively creeped out at the mention of a miniskirt I had worn a few days prior. Oh, nothing. I just really liked it a lot. When I got out of the elevator, he got off on the same floor and was walking past as I took out my keycard to unlock the door to my room. At 4am that morning, I woke up with a startle, only to register that there was a man standing silently at the foot of my bed, a man in a security guard uniform, the one from the elevator. As he saw me wake up, he stammered something about my door not being locked properly and ran out of the room. I was still groggy with sleep and didn't fully register what had just happened. A moment after he ran out, I became aware I was lying on my back with covers around my ankles. I sleep nude, but never kick my covers off in my sleep as I was always cold and the AC was on full blast as well. I'm also a very deep sleeper so someone standing at my bed alone would never stir me. I'm pretty sure him pulling the covers back causing me to get cold is what woke me. I am scared to think what could have happened had my friend not been fast asleep in the next bed. Unfortunately, as I was creeped out in the elevator and had avoided making eye contact or looking at his face, and as it was so dark I couldn't have identified him in the room, I never bothered to report it to the hotel. I still regret that, years later. I work the night shift at a hotel, so I've had tons of weirdos come through, but this is the most recent. Everything started off normally. Usually once I click in at 11pm, I can just sit at the desk and only see a few people. I am a loner, I prefer it this way. Anyways, at about 2.30 in the morning, a guy in his 30s comes down and stands in front of me at the desk. I've worked this job for five years, so I can pick out the weirdos pretty well, and I knew right away something was off about him. He didn't say anything at first, just stared at me, so I asked, Can I help you? He mumbles something, all I can make out is the word coffee. 
I tell him there's fresh coffee available in the breakfast area behind him. He turns to look, then looks back at me, confused. Do you you have some coffee I can take to my room? My first thought is, this guy is wasted, and I told him he could take a cup of the already made coffee, and I could give him a couple of packs to take to his room. He wanted the packs, so I grabbed a couple and gave them to him, hoping that's all he wanted and I could go back to watching TV. No such luck. He kept standing in front of me, looking at the packets of coffee, confused. I've had enough of drunk guys, so I walk over to the other side of the desk and stare at the TV, ignoring him. After a few minutes, he wanders into the breakfast area and stares at the pots of coffee. Then he wanders over to the fruit, the cereal, yogurt, back to the coffee, just staring at everything and walking in slow circles. After a while of that, he stops looking at the food and looks at the ground, then starts muttering to himself while he's walking in circles. Now he is officially freaking me out. He's at least six inches taller than me, 50 pounds heavier, and I'm the only one on shift. I start thinking of escape options like locking myself in the laundry room, running to the gas station next door, etc. I've had to do it a few times when things have gotten really bad, so I try to plan ahead when someone is giving me bad vibes. About 15 minutes after he starts walking in circles, he heads down the hall, still muttering. I relax, happy he's gone to bed to pass out, and I'll have the lobby to myself again. Probably five minutes later, I glance out the front door and he's right there, staring at me, smoking a cigarette and still talking to himself. I'm starting to think that he's on drugs or something, and that scares me enough to grab a pair of scissors when he's not looking and hold them down by my side. I start to think about calling the police, but what for? He hasn't done anything. So I decide to wait it out and hope he goes to bed soon, since it was after 3am at that point. For the next 30 minutes, he walks up and down the halls, through the lobby and outside, then comes back in through the back door and loops around again. The third time he walks by me, still talking, I was terrified and was on the verge of saying, screw it, calling 911 anyway just to have someone else there with me. Just then an old woman walks up to the desk and asks me to call her a cab. She has no idea how happy I was to see her. I call for her and start chatting her up, very unusual for me just to keep her in the lobby. Weirdo comes around the corner for the fourth time, and the old woman tells him to pack his stuff. They're leaving because he woke her up and she couldn't go back to sleep. Apparently this old lady is Weird Guy's mom. I feel much better knowing he was going to leave as soon as the cab got here. As soon as she told him to pack his stuff, he gets angry. He didn't want to leave. He told her to go back to bed, but she was adamant and after they argued for a bit, Awkward for me just standing there watching, he goes upstairs to pack. She explained to me that she could tell he was getting agitated and it was time to take him home. I talked to her for a while and she opened up to me and told me about how her son is schizophrenic and she is the only one who will take care of him. She told me she just wished someone would take him for just six months, like a hospital, to get him on his meds and into a good routine. I felt so awful for her. She seemed so tired and hopeless and I have mental issues myself so I could relate to the struggle. All of a sudden, weird guy comes running out demanding to stay, and they argue again. Except this time, he sees me watching and focuses on me, storming up to the desk and screaming, She's going to call the cops. I didn't do anything. Are you going to clean my kitchen? Aren't you sucking me yet? And other horrible things while I stood there, stunned. I held up the scissors to defend myself, and his mom screamed, Stop! Do you hear what you're saying to her? And he calmed down just as fast as he snapped. The cab pulled up, and as much as I felt for his mom, I was happy to see them pull away. The past few years, I've had seasonal jobs which allow me to go to pretty cool places and camp all summer, and during winters, housing is provided. Because of this, I do not rent or own a home. I just go from my tent to free housing. I'm a guy in my mid-twenties, what do you expect? September and October is the tricky time, as I do not have housing and it is getting cold out. Rewind to last October. I have a few weeks until my job starts, so I'm biding my time with a mix of camping and crashing at friends' houses. After going to a friend's wedding, I came down with some sort of insane flu and cold. I rarely get sick, but... This was as bad as anything I've experienced. I decided I would just splurge on a motel room for a night or two. 
My voice is nearly gone. Insane sore throat, cold sweat, body aches, the whole shebang. I found a decently priced, not run-down motel, the kind where your door opens to the outside, not a hallway. I take a long hot bath, get curled up in the bed, and am very satisfied with my choice to get a room. And this is where it gets weird. I hear the room next to mine open up and the door slams. The guy inside is on the phone and is furious with someone. He is literally screaming into the phone saying he is going to blow someone's truck up. How could you do this to me, etc, etc. From listening in, you could tell he has been fired from a job and was talking to his boss. This whole time, I hear things being smashed, walls being punched, more screaming. This is where most people would call the cops, but I am not most people. I had already smoked pot in the room. Come on, I'm sick as a dog, what do you expect? And didn't want to deal with the authorities. Suddenly, I heard a huge crash. Legitimately thought the guy must have tried to hang himself. At this point, it is a bit later at night, maybe 9 or so, and I'm sitting in bed having just smoked a bit more to ease the pain surging through my body, and I'm thankful the guy is not screaming into his phone or breaking things at that moment. As I begin to drift off to sleep, I hear a very soft tap, tap, tap. I ignore it, assuming the guy next door is trying to repair something he broke in his rage. Tap, tap, tap. This time louder. Tap, tap, tap. This time it's loud enough for my dog to bark. I get up, look through the peephole, and no one's there. I go back to bed. Tap, tap, tap. By now I have two emotions. The first, I am angry that someone is messing with my sleeping and being sick. The second, I am paranoid because I'm on something and my room probably smells like pot. Then I hear very softly, Bro, let me smoke some. I quickly realize I can either open the door and deal with this, or risk having this person get angry and call the cops or something. Obviously dealing with an unstable psychopath is better than the cops, right? As I go to open the door, it is slam open in my face and a guy in maybe his mid-thirties pushes me aside and comes in. Before I can react, I notice he has an open knife in his hand. Oh god. He immediately starts asking unsettling questions. Who else is in the room? I tell him just my dog and I. He calls bullcrap. Who else is in the room? It is very clear just by looking at his eyes that he is a very unstable individual. Whether he is off his meds or on some meth or something, I have no idea. He proceeds to make me show him the bathroom, proving no one else is here, while warning me of the consequences if I were to lie to him. This whole time, I am debating my options. Keep in mind, I am as sick as a dog, high, and have taken some NyQuil basically I am thoroughly out of it. Once he has verified the place is empty, he goes on a new tangent, all the while holding his deer knife and threatening my dog. Do you have any idea who I am? Do you have any idea who I am? He keeps asking. He goes on to say that he is undercover FBI, clearly not the case, and that I'm in deep if I don't cooperate. This whole thing had been going on for maybe 15 minutes. I had begun to see this probably wasn't going to end very well if I didn't change my strategy of letting him talk. I tell him it seems weird for an FBI agent to barge into a room wanting pot and holding a hunting knife. He responds to that by stabbing his knife into the table and telling me I don't know anything about federal investigations. It is becoming more and more clear that this guy is a moron, albeit a potentially violent one. In a last ditch effort, I say something to the effect of, I don't know why you're doing this. If you want to smoke some pot, okay, but otherwise I'm sick as hell and want to go to bed. He then proceeded to make me load the bowl and take the first hit, to confirm the pot wasn't poisoned. Next he took a hit, it was very clear he had never smoked out of a bowl, as I had to show him the carb and where to light, etc. He takes his hit, coughs his lungs out and smiles, tries to give me a hug, folds up his knife and asks if I wanted to go to the bar. I remind him I am sick evident by the fact that I could only whisper, and he shakes his head, almost embarrassed, and leaves. His room was silent for the rest of the night, so it must have helped him calm down. The rest of the night I laid there wondering if that had really just happened, or if I was hallucinating. In the morning, the mark the knife had left on the table verified that yes, I had just smoked with an insane knife-wielding person. I know a lot of you will say I'm an idiot for smoking my room in the first place, 
to which I can only say it was a calculated risk. I know the smell would be gone by morning so housekeepers wouldn't notice, and being in a state with plenty of medical marijuana, people are fairly friendly towards it. I opted to smoke a bit to ease my pains and discomfort, and it certainly worked, short of attracting a possible knife to the face. A few months ago, I got sent overseas on a work trip to India for about a month. A group of colleagues and I stayed at a really nice five-star hotel. After a long day of work, I decided to head to the hotel gym. I was on the treadmill for most of the time, and I noticed this guy, middle-aged, Caucasian, kind of greasy looking, looking at me via the mirrors at the gym. It wasn't a big deal at the start, so I ignored it and carried on running. When I finished running and was stretching, this guy came up to me and asked me about my exercise regimen. I sort of gave him half answers. After that brief encounter, I went for a swim in the hotel pool. It is outdoors and really nice. I swim quite regularly, so I am accustomed to wearing Speedos, admittedly sometimes a bit too small and tight. I went into the pool and swam for around a half an hour and decided to hop out of the pool. As I walked to my towel, I noticed the same guy sitting at an adjacent chair. He was staring quite intently at me, and my package. He grinned and waved at me. I was sort of weirded out, so I quickly covered myself with a towel and got out of there. As I was walking out, he looked at me and said, You have a really well-defined torso, and winked. By then, it was already the creepiest thing to happen to me, ever. Later in the evening, I was already headed to the bar to meet with my colleagues for a couple of drinks and dinner. It was a bit early, so I sat at the bar myself with a drink, reading the newspaper. Suddenly, as I was intently reading, I hear someone slowly slide into the chair next to me. I dropped the newspaper thinking it was my colleague, but lo and behold, it was the same creepy dude. I was a bit taken aback at this point and didn't know what to say, but he just looks at me dead in the eye and says, Hey there, pretty boy. At this point, I was trying really hard not to burst into laughter. Come on, does that ever work on anyone? He then goes, So what does a pretty boy like you drink? I politely declined his offer for a drink, told him I was not interested and was waiting for friends. Luckily at that point, a colleague had come down and waved at me. The creepy guy left and sat at a table a few meters from us. For an hour or so, the creepy guy remained seated intently staring at me. At least that's what my colleagues told me, because they thought it was hilarious. After that, he left the bar and I had a pretty enjoyable evening. After dinner and a few drinks, I went back up to my room. I lived on the same floor as my colleague, but his room was on the other side of the hotel wing. So we went up the lift and when we were about to part ways to our respective wings, we saw the creepy guy standing around my hotel door. I think he was shocked to see me accompanied with a friend. So as soon as he sees us, he darted down the corridor and into a side lift. I was a little bit freaked out that night and chain locked my door shut and blocked it with a chair. Luckily, I heard no weird noises or knocks in the middle of the night and every time I hear pretty boy, I just shudder. I'm a woman and looking back at the story I recognize everything I did wrong and am horrified but it's a good warning. I am generally a very skeptical, aware person, lock my car doors right after I get in, trust gut feelings, and don't talk on my phone while walking, etc. I'm shocked by how off guard this caught me. Last week I was traveling to Phoenix on business and stayed in an embassy suite. Nice hotel, stayed there lots of times without problems. I have noticed it is pretty lightly staffed, but no issues. At 6.45 in the morning, my hotel room phone rang. I answered, thinking it must be the front desk, and the person on the other end says, Hi, is this Jenny? I said yes, and had the TV on in the background, so couldn't hear him, so I said, Hang on a second, and muted it. He then said, Oh, I'm sorry, are you having a meeting? Am I interrupting? No, I, it's just the TV, uh, can I help you? First, let me just tell you, this guy was extremely suave, charming, and disarming. Suave, but not in a slimy way, just totally friendly and nice. Long story short, 
he goes down this whole path of saying, you aren't going to believe who this is. It's a blast from the past. Do you know who this is? Super fun and playful like a friend would be if they were calling you out of the blue. I do a lot of work in Phoenix and have for many years, and I changed my cell phone number about a year ago. So while it would be incredibly odd for someone to call me at the hotel, I really was trying to rack my brain and figure out who might have heard I was in town and wanted to get in touch. Finally, I told him I didn't know who he was and he'd have to tell me. Okay, I'll tell you, but you have to guess a city first. Think of a time you met someone in another city, had a great time, and never saw them again. Someone you got a little crazy with. Just to get things moving, I guess Cleveland. I did go to Cleveland on business about eight years ago, but I didn't do anything crazy there. Yep, Cleveland. No, I still don't know who this is. Think of a Cleveland Browns player you met and had a really good time with. At this point, I clearly know the call isn't for me, and I say definitively, No, I don't think so. In response, he says, Oh my goodness, do I have the wrong Jenny? Is this Jenny Miller? Nope, wrong person. So he, in a very friendly and engaging way, tells me, I called the front desk and they must have just been going down the room list and connected me to the wrong Jenny. Well, since I'll never meet you in person, I'll tell you, I met this girl in Cleveland about two years ago. And we were both married, but we just had an awesome time and it was, it was all about the sex. She drunk texted me two weeks ago and she told me she was going to be in town and I thought I'd call her and surprise her. I kind of chuckled and said, Oh, interesting. Uh, well, good luck. He, again charmingly, starts to flirt with me. I don't remember exactly how the conversation went, but it was moving quickly and was something along the lines of, Sounds like you had a crazy time in Cleveland too. Well, since I'll never meet you in person. By the way, creepy that he repeated this twice. It stood out to me. Let me ask you, are you as pretty as you sound? Then he described himself and asked me, which I very foolishly told him my age, city I'm from, and that I'm married. He then says, Hey, tell me what happened for you in Cleveland. At that point, I finally wised up and said, I'm not going to continue this conversation. At which point he promptly hung up. I had about 30 minutes until I needed to leave and felt very unsettled as I reflected on the call. How did he get patched through to my room without my full name, but knowing my first? Obviously, he somehow requested to be connected to my name and made up a story about knowing the last name, maybe. Did he possibly know my room number? Was he lurking and waiting for me? I waited until I saw another woman go to the elevator and jumped out of my room behind her so I wouldn't be alone. At the front desk, I was telling the manager very briefly about it to try to get to the bottom of how they got through to my room and another woman standing nearby said, Did someone call your room looking for Sarah Miller? I said, No, he called looking for Jenny Miller. My name is Jenny. And then she said, I had a guy call my room looking for Sarah Miller, and my name is Sarah. I was asleep, and he just said really cheerfully, Best wake-up call ever. But I was so disoriented, I didn't keep talking to him. The manager who was the only one working the desk, sort of acknowledged he had some calls come in, but sort of brushed it off and moved on to the next person. So I didn't get to the bottom of that, which, reflecting on it, I should have pushed much harder and may call and do so, but it was all moving really fast. Okay, so pretty creepy, right? Totally disarming personality, disarmed me by doing it in the morning instead of the evening, knew my name, called a hotel phone, got me to acknowledge I was alone, made me pick a city and then made a tie to it, made himself sound like a cool football player even though he clearly wasn't. All kinds of creepy stuff. Here's my question. What was this guy going for? I can only think of a couple of options. One, trying to get someone to talk dirty on the phone for some jollies. Least creepy of the options, but I feel like he didn't move it that way quickly enough and wasn't explicit enough to make that the goal. Or two, I really got the vibe that he was trying to find someone that would be willing to meet him in person. I felt like if I'd continue the conversation, it was going towards, Hey, I was trying to call Jenny Miller, but you sound really fun and cute. Would you want to meet for a drink? 
Who knows what his or his buddy's intentions would be? Kidnapping seems over the top, but hey, it happens. Or maybe just a lonely guy looking for a date. I googled and found no similar stories. Maybe I googled the wrong thing. I did find the front desk scam where they pose as the front desk and try to get your credit card number, but nothing like this. I am generally no slouch when it comes to personal security, and it freaks me out how easily I was put into friendly mode instead of skeptical mode here. My friends have been shocked when I told them the story and said if anyone was going to fall for it, I'd be the last person they would think. I'm still trying to figure out what this guy might have been after. So this happened quite a few years ago. I was probably 12 or 13 at the time and was staying at a hotel with my parents, aunt and uncle, cousin, who's a year older than I am, and thus 13 or 14 at the time. One night, our parents decided to go get coffee together at a little cafe in the lobby of this hotel. Now, it's important to know that this is one of those hotels that was set up over a few buildings with its hallway set up outside the hotel, like a multi-story motel. You could access the halls by stairs in the corner of the buildings. The cafe my parents went to was several buildings away from the one we were staying, but that wasn't a problem for my cousin and I, seeing as the pool was just downstairs. At about 8 o'clock, we texted our parents on her flip phone, put on our bathing suits and went downstairs to the pool. Things were fine at first. We swam around and caught up on things that happened at school, the boyfriend she'd broken up with, etc., Eventually, we ended up just quietly floating on our backs, watching the stars. Without looking over at my cousin, I said something to the effect of, Wow, nice night, huh? In a weird voice, hoping to earn a laugh. When I heard a guy's chuckle, though, I sat up in the water really fast, my face quickly growing red. I hadn't noticed that I had floated away from my cousin and was now next to some guy. He was probably in his early 20s, and he offered me a friendly glance an eyebrow raising. Yeah, I guess it is. At 13, I was cripplingly shy, so I just gave a nervous laugh and hightailed it back over to my cousin, who promptly burst into laughter and started making fun of me, jokingly demanding if he was cute and if he really had laughed at the dumb voice I had made. I was too embarrassed to find the situation funny and stayed really close to her, not daring to glance back down to the other end of the pool where he was now sitting on the edge. My cousin, Lizzie, just moved on, chatting about random things as we waited in the pool. She got progressively quieter, though, eventually playfully splashing me to get my attention. Your new boyfriend is still watching us, she noted, and even though she was still grinning, her voice didn't sound quite so teasing anymore. I glanced over to where, sure enough, he was still sitting on the edge of the pool, watching us. She splashed me again. Dude, don't pay him any attention. You may not know much about guys, but I do, and the trick is just to ignore him. She wasn't exactly wrong. I was homeschooled and didn't ever talk to any guys older than I was, and in my eyes she was an expert on worldly wisdom. I watched her face, mimicking her and playfully splashing back. Maybe we should go get mom, or your mom or something, I said as she shook her head. No, let's go back to the hotel room, I don't want my mom to freak out. That seemed like a good idea to both of us. Her mom was kind of terrifying when she was mad. We can text her when we get up there. I nodded, moving and pushing myself out of the pool, grabbing her towels and shoes. She made some joke about what was going on, but I didn't hear it. The guy was standing up too, though he seemed to be pretty casual about getting his own things. When I looked back at her, her expression confirmed she had seen it, but she just kept putting on her shoes. I followed suit, walking close behind her when she turned to head up towards the stairs. We began walking up them, both of us a little nervous but trusting it was just coincidence until we heard footsteps behind us on the stairs. A brief glance down showed the same guy just a flight behind us, meeting my gaze with a little grin. He didn't seem high or drunk, at least from my sheltered perspective. Lizzie? I said, quietly trying to alert her that he was so close. She was moving up the stairs much faster now. I know. Let's go to the wrong floor. We can loop back around and then just go to our rooms. We'll call mom once we get there. She promised, seeming more strained. Her pretty face screwed up a bit more with anxiety. 
As an avid reader of mystery, it seemed like the best possible choice, so we got off two floors early and sped walked down the outdoor hall and around the corner. As soon as we were out of sight, Lizzie grabbed my hand, taking off at a run and nearly jerking me off my feet. Before that moment, I hadn't been legitimately scared, but fear is infectious. I squeezed her hand, keeping up pace as footsteps that weren't ours began echoing on the same floor we had chosen to loop around on. We whipped around to the next corner, and the next, until we breathlessly found the stairs again and took them two at a time. It prompted a high-pitched squeal from Lizzie who, at this point, was more dragging me along than anything else. I was scared out of my wits and practically paralyzed, tripping up the stairs and down the hall on our floor. She jammed the key into our room's door and pushed me inside, slamming the door and drawing the blinds as soon as we were inside, bursting into tears as soon as the doors were locked. I felt numb. She was crying more from adrenaline than anything, but after she had calmed down, she wasted no time picking up the phone and trying to call her mom, who didn't pick up, then my mom, who similarly didn't have her phone on. At the age of 12, it felt like we must have waited hours sitting in our bed, hugging each other and shivering from still wearing wet bathing suits. We did end up calming down, though, offering each other quiet rationalizations of what had happened. Maybe we had just picked that guy's floor. Maybe he hadn't been trying to follow us. When you're scared, it's honestly surprising how easily to eventually just believe things were all coincidence. Much calmer, we decided to do a really dumb thing. Go out to the car to get Lizzie's activity bag full of snacks and her Game Boy. It seemed like an alright idea at the time since we both believed it had just been a coincidence and since we were both starving. We wrapped up in our towels, she grabbed her mom's keys and her cell phone, and we made a plan at the hotel room door. We lock ourselves in the car if this guy comes back and call whatever numbers we can think of. If he appears while we were walking back, we'd go to the lobby and find our parents. It seemed pretty foolproof at the time. Now, just kind of horror story dumb. Nothing happened until we got to the parking lot in front of our building, when we hear a voice shout at us from one of the halls. Hey girls, where do you think you're going, cuties? I look back behind us, to where a creepy guy was leaning on the rails on our floor. Lizzie gave some sort of unearthly screech and grabbed my hand again, dragging me along before I could get a better look. She yanked open the car door and dove inside as I tumbled after her, locking the car as soon as we were both inside. As soon as she had caught her breath, she untangled herself from me and pulled herself into the back of the minivan, back into the furthest row and motioning for me to follow. I did so, hunkering down with her between the seats. I had never felt like my own breathing was loud before, but as we lay there in dead silence, it seemed ungodly loud. Then, tapping. I squeezed my eyes shut, not even wanting to know what he was doing outside the car. But the sound of tapping was unmistakable, like he was just drumming his fingers on the window. Lizzie pulled me tight, not moving, like he wouldn't be able to see us if we had just held still enough. I don't know how long we stayed there, frozen in terror. I wasn't sure what was worse, the darkness of keeping my eyes closed, or what it would be like to look up and see him standing there. And just like that, he stopped. Neither of us moved for another 10 to 15 minutes. I started crying, scared to death, Lizzie just holding deathly still until she began pushing me to sit up, hands rough. I realized what she was doing a moment later when I heard her dialing on the phone and the sound of each of our parents' voicemail. She didn't call 911. Maybe now that we're older, we would have, but at 13, 911 was a number reserved for house fires and murders not guys in their 20s following little girls to the car. Dumb, right? We eventually ran out of the car and back to the hotel, slamming and locking the door and falling into a sobbing heap inside. When our parents did get back, they bemoaned not having had their cell phones on and soothed us, eventually convincing us that, though the guy was creepy, we hadn't been in any danger. I think they thought that was the truth and, honestly, it was what we all wanted to believe. Lizzie and I saw him a few times after that, mostly at night when he sat by the pool and offered us a little grin every time we passed, but we were always with our parents until we left the hotel. When he saw us packing our bags and leaving with our parents, he offered us this forlorn little wave that no one but me saw, mouthing something to me, see you later cutie. I didn't tell my parents, it didn't seem worth it. 
It's not till now that I realize how creepy this guy really was, and while he could be just some harmless guy who thought it was hilarious to follow preteen girls around a hotel, I'm glad I never saw him again. As a brief introduction for some background on how this happened, allow me to say I'm an old school metalhead. I travel around my tri-state area to see various heavy metal shows. The town I live in is a small town with no real musical scene outside of hip-hop and pop music. No venue here has anything I'd like to pay money to see. As such, I'm forced to travel at least an hour or so away to see any shows I'd like to see. This has me often traveling with my wife, my favorite concert buddy, usually clear across the state to see concerts. There is a particular venue we love to frequent, but it's a good three to three and a half hour drive away. But it always has great metal acts playing there, many coming in from Europe. When we go to this place, we usually stay in a hotel casino that's about three to four blocks from the venue. It's a short walk. This particular night, we just finished seeing Dark Tranquility, a Swedish melodic death metal band. It was about 2 a.m. when we got out of the venue as we'd stayed behind for a little bit afterwards hoping to meet either Dark Tranquility or some of the opening bands afterwards, as often happens at small venues like this. And we did, so it was a little while after the show before we got out of there. So we leave and begin to make the walk back to the hotel. There are tons of fellow metalheads milling out as well, and it's kind of a general idea for many of us to stay in the same hotel, since it's right around the corner, like I said, just a few blocks over. So we're kind of all walking in this large mob. Now, if you're into the heavy metal scene and frequent live shows, you know that it's a fairly tightly knit community. We're all there for the same reason, so everyone is usually pretty friendly and talkative, discussing the show, past shows, meeting band members, etc. Lots of jovial discussion. I had to pee for over an hour at this point, but hadn't wanted to dip into the restroom during the end of the band's show, and afterward, the restroom was packed with a line flowing back out onto the floor. At this point, though, it's hitting me pretty hard, as I've had a few drinks in the club. So rather than wait until we get back to our room, I decided I needed to stop at the public restroom down at the bottom of the parking garage and take this whiz. It needed to happen. My wife doesn't mind, as she said she needed to pee anyway herself, so we split off. I come into the restroom and think I'm by myself, so I hit the first urinal there and start to have at it. As I'm about to finish up, the door creaks open and this rather large, bald fellow comes in. He stops dead in his tracks right in front of the door for a moment and takes me in, like he didn't expect anyone else to be in there. Then goes to the sink as I'm doing the same to start washing his face. I'm washing my hands and he looks over at me with water running off his nose and asks what I'm doing out here so late. I just explain that I'm coming back from a concert without looking at him. He then starts to ask what kind of music. I explained to him that it was a heavy metal concert. He kind of shrugs and nods and says, cool. I'm finishing up and drying my hands now and he turns around and grabs my upper arm lightly and says, hey, then maybe you're interested in buying something I have. He starts to rifle through his jean pockets and mumbles that it's there somewhere. I try to politely tell him I'm not interested and need to get back out. He sort of shuffles in front of me quickly, semi-blocking the door. He looks kind of angry at this point and juts out his shoulders. He's probably a good foot taller than me. I'm a fairly short guy, so this isn't really too hard to do, but still. He says, Look man, no need to be rude. I again decline, trying to stay polite. At this point, I'm starting to tense up, anticipating a scuffle. The problem is, I'm exhausted. I just spent the better part of three hours jumping around and smashing my body into other bodies. Quite frankly... I'm ready to collapse. The guy grabs my arm again, this time a little harder and goes, Hey man, I'm talking to you. My sense of trying to be reasonable has left me at this point, as I'm too tired to care anymore. Knowing I shouldn't, I tell him, Man, you're the one being the jerk. I'm tired and I'm just trying to get out of here, so move out of the way. He shoves me, not really too hard, but from the chest and steps in closer to close the gap, saying, I was just trying to be nice. Screw you, man. You trying to start something with me? It runs through my head that while I almost always usually have a pocket knife on me in case things like this happen to go down, I'm completely unarmed because I knew I couldn't bring the knife with me into the venue club through their security. 
so I'm preparing for the worst as the guy seems hopped up on something, is a good deal bigger than me, and I'm in about zero shape to fight. It's about to get hairy. The guy's blocking my way to the door, as it's a pretty small restroom, and just as I'm thinking this, the door creaks again, and I hear laughter and talking start to flood in. The guy lets go of my arm and turns around to look at a group of five guys in black t-shirts, studded leather jackets adorned with dozens of band logo patches and jeans stroll into the restroom. One of them is a Hispanic fellow with long, curly, dark hair. He sees me and waves and exclaims, Ah, oh, dude, what's up? This was a sick show tonight, wasn't it? One of his friends, another Hispanic guy with a shaved head, I think took in what might have been going on in here and says, This guy giving you crap, man? To me. I look back to my bald assailant. A worried expression has crossed over his features. Even being a pretty big guy, he realizes he's now got five guys at his back, a few of them about his height too, and they're all pretty decked out too. They probably will look pretty intimidating to the average person not at a metal concert. He glances at me for a split second before saying, Nah man, we're just talking. And I interject quickly, fed up with this a-hole. And now we're done talking. Get out of my way. Next time, don't be an ass. And start to barge past him, pushing him aside. The Hispanic dude with long hair turns back to me as I'm passing and says, Have a good night, man. And I meet up with my wife who decided to stay outside for a smoke. She asks what took so long, joking that I had to take a huge crap, and I tell her about it as we're going up the elevator into the hotel. We decide to stop in at the Inn Hotel Bar and Grill before returning to our room as we're both kind of hungry. After ordering, we're standing by the counter for a few minutes, and I hear laughter and loud voices coming in from the lobby. We turn around, and the same group of five guys is coming our way back toward the snack shop and bar and grill. The long-haired guy sees us and goes, Oh, dude! Look at this! And points to the window, looking out the lobby down into the entrance of the parking garage. There's the bald guy down there, laying on the ground and being handcuffed with two police officers over him. One of them has his taser in one hand, and its line is connected to the guy's side. He starts to tell me that apparently the guy had stuck around in the restroom as they'd left, and one of them went over to a parked police car a few aisles over in the garage after noticing there was an officer in it. They told him that some guy was on something in there, and that he'd been acting threatening and kind of shady. So apparently the officer and his partner had decided to step inside the restroom and take a look. As the guys from the concert were going up the elevator to the hotel lobby, it's a see-through glass tube elevator. They'd heard some shouting and looked down to see the guy being drug out of the restroom by both officers. I guess he resisted or something, because apparently there had been a scuffle before one of them tasered him, and then all we saw now was him getting cuffed and dragged to the police car. We all had a good laugh about it and talked while we waited on our food. Nice guys. I connected with one of them on Facebook, and we still laugh about that guy on occasion. This is one of the creepiest stories from my aunt's tenure as the general manager of a fairly busy hotel in the Sacramento, California area. It was an otherwise normal and quiet weeknight when a guest called the front desk as if though they had sent someone to check on her air conditioning as there was a maintenance worker outside her door who said he needed to come in and work on it. It's hot in Sacramento and she'd been using the air conditioning that day. It seemed fine and she got a bad vibe so she called to check. The hotel hadn't sent anyone. The front desk attendant told her to lock her door as thoroughly as possible, called security and they rushed to her room. The guy was gone. The guest told them that she had a fairly quiet night. She'd gone out to dinner, come back to the hotel, relaxed in the hot tub for a while, and then headed back to her room, and 20 minutes or so later the guy knocked on her door. The hotel staff went to review the security footage and eventually found the tape of her sitting in the hot tub alone. They watched her get out, then watched as, about ten seconds later, a guy climbed out from behind some nearby bushes and went off in the same direction she had. They weren't able to identify or find the guy and never had another report of a fake handyman. This happened about two years ago when I was 17. 
I was on a holiday with my mum in South Africa, and we were staying for a few nights in Cape Town before we came home to Australia. My mum had always shared stories about loads of unnerving experiences she had as a child growing up in South Africa, so I was always a bit on edge. It was the morning before we left, and I went down to the breakfast buffet later than usual. I got there just as mum was about to head back upstairs to pack up. It was a pretty nice hotel with a lot of staff around, so she wasn't worried about leaving me by myself to eat. As I was eating, I noticed an Indian woman, roughly 40 years old, sitting nearby looking at me. Even though it wasn't too odd, I kept it in the back of my mind. I finished eating my food and got up to go to the elevator. Strangely, the woman did the same. We got in and I pressed the number for my floor, although she didn't press a number which at the time I didn't think much of. As the doors closed on us, she began talking to me, asking things like, where are you from and what is your age? I don't think English was her first language. I told her that I was 17 and from Australia, and she told me that her brother lives here. Thankfully, the elevator had reached my level by that point and the doors opened. I'm normally pretty shy and didn't really want to talk to her anymore. Her friendly questions were giving me bad vibes and making me unnervy. But she kept on talking with me and then suddenly goes, You should come and see my room. She stops right away and gestures towards a room to my left which has an open door. I'm more than creeped out at this point, but I glance inside instinctively. There's a man facing us, sitting on the edge of the bed. He's looking at her and I expectantly. My stomach drops and I immediately start running towards my room. They didn't chase after me and I reached my room safely. I briefly mentioned it to my mom when she asked me why I was puffing, but I didn't go into too much depth about it. I hadn't added up all of the details at that point, noticing her at breakfast, her not pressing a button on the elevator, etc. I'm not sure exactly what would have happened if I hadn't been as suspicious of her to begin with, or if I'd gone into that room, but I am certain that it would have been something very, very bad. The night of my sister's wedding, the hotel realized they were overbooked, and my boyfriend and I suddenly found ourselves needing to find another hotel room at almost 11pm on a Saturday night. We drove around for what seems like forever in the town we were in, and finally found a vacancy at a Super 8. It wasn't in the best neighborhood, but the rooms were clean enough. My boyfriend had way too much to drink at the wedding, and passed out cold as soon as we got to the room. Back then I used to smoke a little and had brought some and proceeded to do so as I watched television. At about 12.30am, all of a sudden there was a huge bang on our hotel room door. I literally almost fell out of the bed, it scared me so bad. Someone was on the other side of the door, banging on the door. Like door shaking, heart stopping banging on the door. I should also mention that these hotels had the entryways set up on the outside of the hotel, so whoever it was did not have to come into the hotel, they could have just walked up from the street. I tried to wake up my drunk boyfriend, but couldn't get him to wake up no matter what I did. I still to this day do not understand how this ruckus didn't wake him up. The super loud banging on the door continued relentlessly. All of a sudden, the man on the other side of the door started screaming and yelling through the door in another language, possibly Creole, something with an island accent, and wailing at the top of his lungs. Oh my god, the wailing. It was legitimately the most scary and haunting sound I had ever heard. I can't even begin to describe the sound of his wailing, other than it was one of the most gut-wrenching sounds I have ever heard. I was too terrified to walk up to the window and look out, and too scared to call the police because of me smoking and how the room smelled. I tried to call the front desk, but the phone just rang and rang. This continued for at least 20 to 30 minutes, the whole time with the loud banging, wailing, and foreign words being yelled in an angry voice. I thought he was going to kick in the door or break the window because he was going freaking crazy out there. I was so terrified that I went in the opposite corner of the room and just sat in the corner crying until it finally stopped. No one from any rooms beside us ever came out or anything, so maybe they were all vacant. I have no idea, but it seemed like this lasted forever. When it stopped, I heard the man go down the outside stairs, so I know he left. Still, I didn't sleep at all that night. When my boyfriend finally woke up, I told him about this scary wailing man 
and we left as soon as he woke up. When I checked out of the hotel, I asked the lady at the desk if there had been some incident or anything reported by anyone, and she said no. What the heck? Is this a normal occurrence? I have never been so happy to leave a hotel in my life. This just happened tonight, not to me, but to my wife. I'm writing this from a McDonald's parking lot three blocks from the police station where my wife is giving her statement. She works front desk at a hotel. It's a busy one, given more to the business types. She usually works until 11 or midnight, and being the protective type, I'm usually there with her, though not for altogether altruistic reasons, but Wi-Fi, coffee, and TV. Three weeks back, I'm there watching an episode of Justified, and I meet this fellow, I got his name but forgot it instantly. He's staying there long term, not going to say why, business of sorts. I don't really like him. One, he interrupted my show. Two, I can tell he's off, rambling, has a cast on his hand from what he said was hitting a wall, speaks of 2012 prophecy and fundamentalist Christianity, talks of being sober from drink for 36 months but takes a lot of pills. He's got issues. He had an ambulance called last week apparently an OD. Still there, tonight he calls down to my wife, says call the police. My wife asks if anyone's hurt, he says someone will be in about 90 seconds. She acquiesces and the cops are called. So I'm not there tonight, but what I know she told me while waiting to be interviewed. He comes down and goes to the dining room, and he's got a gun. The assistant manager goes out there, and then my wife does a couple minutes later. The assistant manager is face down on the carpet, the man over him still holding the gun. He sees my wife, then points the gun at her. Monday, the manager of the hotel says he doesn't want me there all the time. Nothing personal, he just thinks it might be weird to the guests. That's why I wasn't there, I was out with some friends. The man continues to point the gun at my wife. He hears something, gets distracted, and my wife backs up and gets behind the wall. The police come in, a lot of them. She hears the man yelling, then she hears a shot. She didn't know who pulled the trigger first. This happened when I was about 11 while on vacation with my family. We had stopped in Flint for the night at a hotel, and being 11, I was excited to use the pool at the hotel. My dad didn't want to go, but my mom reluctantly decided to take me. We were the only ones there for a while, but then two boys not much older than me jumped into the pool to swim too. I was a shy kid, so I was keeping to myself, mostly just swimming from one side of the pool to the other. My mom apparently decides that I'm fine without her and goes into the sauna. I was fine for a while. The two brothers kept looking over at me, which made me feel weird, but I was too shy, so I think anyone looking at me would make me feel weird. I felt awkward but not too worried or scared so I just kept swimming. Then the boys started catcalling to me from across the pool. I just kept swimming and ignoring them. Then one of them said, Come here. And I said no. I go back to swimming, trying my best to ignore them when I suddenly get tackled from above. The kid held me underwater for long enough where I was clawing at him and freaking out, but he eventually gets me above the water and his brother and him push me against the side of the pool and make dirty comments at me trying to pull at my swimsuit. I was terrified. I remember squirming around and crying, but if I raised my voice too high, they would dunk my head back under the water until I stopped. I was in adrenaline mode and honestly had no idea how I got away, but luckily I did and I hightailed it to the sauna. I didn't tell my mom, and still to this day, I'm not quite sure why. I was working at a Holiday Inn in Omaha, Nebraska back in my college days. Normally I was a bellman, but sometimes I worked the desk. One day, an odd-looking guy comes up to the front desk. He's wearing clothes straight out of the 1970s, like a super creepy version of Dan from The Good Guys. Aviators, greasy hair with a massively receding hairline and a mustache. He has a cane and walks with a pretty severe limp. He asked me where he can get paramedic patches. 
He says he was called into town on a special assignment to help out with paramedic duties, but they make him provide his own patches. This all seemed pretty odd to me, so I told him I didn't know where he could buy them, and he eventually left. Later, I got a call to a room to check out the hot water. There was a report that the hot water wasn't working, it was coming out cold. I went to the room, knocked on the door, and an old lady in a nightgown answered the door. I introduced myself, but she didn't respond. She just stood there motionless. Her mouth was agape the whole time, the way you'd imagine a lobotomized person to look. I saw a motionless pair of legs lying on the bed, but I didn't look around the corner to check it out. I went into the bathroom, turned on the water, and it was instantly extremely hot. The old lady never said a word, and I told her that the hot water was working just fine, and I quickly left the room. Later, the creepy man from before arrives back up at the desk complaining that he'd called about the hot water not working in his room. Naturally, I connected the dots and, oh god, not this mindset set in. I followed him back to his room at an extremely slow pace. He was very dependent on his cane. When we got to the room, the old lady was standing there, still agape in her nightgown, not saying a word. This time, I could see that the pair of legs on the bed were attached to an old man, now sitting. The old man sat there motionless, also agape and not saying a word, just looking at me. I explained to the creepy man that I'd already been there and that the hot water was working just fine. The weird part was that he didn't care at all about the water. He got out a duffel bag. From the duffel bag, he pulled out a stuffed Bugs Bunny doll. He held it out at arm's length and offered it to me. I reached out for it, not knowing why, and he pulled it back in a mind-don't-touch-it kind of manner. He held it out to me again, as if he were offering it to me. I reluctantly reached out to grab it, and once again he pulled it back. The old man and woman kept staring at us, not saying a word, but smiling with their mouths open and making laughing sounds. That's the best I can describe them, the entire time this is all happening. He then took a Donald Duck doll out of his bag. He held it out to me. I didn't reach for it. He kept holding it out, and kept holding it out, so I reached for it. He immediately pulled it away with the same you-can't-have-that reaction. I slowly backed out of the door, told them to have a good stay, and never saw them again. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio.